Good morning, everybody. Welcome uh, to this uh, asynchronous showdown uh, between Java virtual threads and Kotlin coroutines. Oh, doors will be closed. Cool. Okay, so who am I? My name is Ricardo Lipolis. I'm a software developer, software engineer, architect, DevOps, you know, like everybody comes up with these new titles. But basically, I develop software in the Netherlands at JDriven, a company that's uh, doing consultancy for all sorts of big companies uh, in the Netherlands, uh, based around Rotterdam. Um, and I've been doing Java for more than 15 years now, and in the last five years also focused on, uh, on Kotlin. And I've already done some talks about reactive programming in the past, uh, about Kotlin, uh, also coroutines. So virtual threads was basically the logical next step, right? So I'm going to start with a huge spoiler because, you know, like I know it's a very clickbaity title, like async showdown, but uh, what I'm actually going to show you today is that it's not really a battle between virtual threads and coroutines. Uh, I think coroutines is going to keep on existing. It's not going to go away because of virtual threads, but I also think virtual threads are very promising. Uh, they pr promise a lot of cool new stuff in the JVM, and I think they're actually going to strengthen each other. So it's not really a battle at all. So I hope today to show you what actually you know, what what that means concretely. So let's start with okay, what kind of problem are we trying to solve? Or let's keep it positive, call it a challenge. We all know that resources are finite. You know, like CPU, memory, they don't they are not infinite. So we have to handle them with care. They cost money especially if you, know, you see your cloud bill from AWS or Google Cloud or whatever, it just costs money. So it's good if we somehow can optimize the usage of those resources and use them as effectively, efficiently as possible. So let's come with a concrete example. Maybe some of you are um, in the business of developing these kinds of applications, but given a typical Java web application that handles some incoming HTTP requests, typically or traditionally, they use the, the thread per request model, which means that every request that comes in gets assigned a thread from a thread pool, and the whole process of dealing with that request um, is handled by that single thread. And of course, you can spawn other threads doing stuff, but that thread is responsible for handling that whole request. But threads, they cost resources. I mean, it, of course, they use some CPU time because they do some work and the threads have to be managed, uh, like context switching, etc. cetera. Um, and the memory is, of course, also needed because, uh, well, the operating system thread needs memory. Uh, there's a stack involved. So there's all kinds of resources involved with the pool of threads you're using to handle those requests. So if we visualize this, um, that what I'm showing here is basically um, a web application with some, some logic. Um, there are a few users here that, are, that want to do some requests, get some information from that service. And every request that comes in has to do some external API call to uh, some cloud service, and it has to do a database call. And we, what we have here is our thread pool with currently only two threads. Of course, in reality, we have more, but just for the sake of example. What happens? You can see the color of the thread changing, and that means that yellow means it's busy doing something, and red means it's waiting for some external service. Well, what you already see here that are some requests are just queued, waiting until there's a thread available to serve that request, and ultimately threads do uh, get the, uh, available. But you can imagine, like, if the number of requests grows, then some people are going to be mad because their request takes too long. Threads get blocked, um, and that's kind of a waste of resource, right? I mean, when we're calling that external cloud service, and that takes maybe milliseconds or even seconds to respond, depending on the context, that thread is basically doing nothing. So it's wasting um, that resource. And of course, we also have the scaling issues, uh, given the fact that we can only have a maximum number of concurrent requests that's equal to the number of threads we have in our pool. So before, we had two threads in our pool, but we had four requests, but only two of them could be handled at the same time. So the typical solution 
you hear is non-blocking I.O. So we need to ditch that idea of having a thread per request and basically say, okay, we have a pool of threads handling all the work and we have requests coming in and the moment some I.O. occurs, some call to the database or a call to the external web servers, we release that thread to do other work. So that looks like this. Uh, again, four people with the same uh, request and again, a thread pool of two threads. But now we use non-blocking I.O., which means that when there's an external service call going on, you can see thread one is being used to serve those other requests. So it's all a bit more smooth. You know, like the, the request gets picked up quickly. You can still have some latency here because, well, there are still only two threads. I mean, we're not, like, we don't get infinite resource for free, but the whole thing handles uh, a lot quicker, uh, quicker and people have to wait less. So that's good, right? So the threads, they are not sleeping while there's still work to do. So there is less waste of resources. But of course, this comes with a price because, well, we're adding complexity. Like, um, we need to code a way uh, to, to handle the fact that threads are going to switch. Uh, when we're debugging, we'll get this whole weird stack trace that doesn't make sense anymore. Uh, and there's some context switching be between threads because threads are not li uh, linked to specific requests anymore. And how do we implement this on the JVM? I mean, we have completable futures, but yeah, that leads to some kind of callback hell. And we saw in JavaScript, well, that, that was not nice. So in JavaScript, they came up with the async await to help them um, handle this, yeah, or prevent this callback hell, basically. But we don't have async await in Java. Um, so in 2014, there was this group of people that came up with uh, a reactive manifesto that said, well, a reactive system should be able to uh, be uh, responsive in all scenarios. So it has to be elastic, has to be resilient for error, uh, it needs to be uh, to scale. And in order to do that, it has to be message driven, which basically means loosely coupled. So it relates to the non-blocking I.O., but non-blocking I.O. is only part of reactive, but still it's part of that. You know, like, okay, we need to be reactive. We need to be able to scale our application in a, in a good way. So yeah, reactive systems was just like a general term. And at some point you saw people developing um, Java libraries, frameworks to implement the reactive concepts in your application. So you had like RxJava, um, uh, Project Reactor, which ultimately led to uh, Spring Webflux, which was basically the Spring version of a reactive framework where in, I think it was 2016, uh, they released this. And there were some smart people giving a presentation about that way, way long ago. But even then, we already saw that, well, there's some complexity there. Like, it's very cool, but yeah, I mean, you have to write your code in, in a totally different way instead of just using for loops and if statements. You had like flat maps, filters, concat map, and just tech traces were weird, and is my code even executed? I don't know. So, yeah, that, you saw that for the, the, the typical Java web application that's just doing some CRUD operations, this was way too complex. And, well, in essence, maybe you didn't even need it. You know, like the traditional Spring MPC application, they work perfectly for that, and still do. So, enter Project Loom. Uh, Brian Getz, for those of you that don't know him, he's the, the Java language architect of Oracle, so he knows about Java. And at some point he said in an uh, AMA session, like, ah, I think Project Loom is going to kill reactive programming. And I think for a lot of use cases, uh, he could be right. Project Loom, basically the idea behind Project Loom was to provide the JVM with the capabilities of doing that non-blocking I.O. thing under the hood uh, without the added complexity needed for the developer. So integrate it in a seamless way inside the JVM so that you as a developer don't need to worry about it. There are still like more complex reactive scenarios uh, when you use like the more advanced reactive concepts that, that still could be a valid use case for reactive programming. But for the 
most part for the like the, the, the general purpose applications, Project Loom might give you some uh, very nice benefits. So Project Loom consists of a number of different items, uh, virtual threads, structured concurrency, and scope values. And well, actually, only virtual threads are going to be like production ready in the upcoming uh, JDK 21 release. Uh, the other parts are still like in incubator preview mode. So in 21, they're both in preview. So you can use them by adding the enable preview flag to your uh, uh, Java or, uh, command line. But keep in mind that it's not necessarily production ready. So you can play around with it, but virtual threads, they are going to be production ready. So let's start with virtual threads. In the current scenario, without virtual threads, this is basically the, the mapping between your operating system thread and the tasks you're doing in your code. So imagine like just starting the main method of your Java application. It runs on the main thread, and that main thread is linked to some operating system thread. And this is always a one-on-one -on -one relation. So an operating system thread linked to one JVM thread linked to one task. So if you create a new thread and submit some runnable that runs on that thread, you get basically a whole new stack of this. Um, and they are relatively, well, compared to virtual thread, they're, going, they're relatively ex expensive. So every time you start a new JVM thread, there's a piece of memory being needed to start that thread. So with virtual threads, it becomes more like this. And it might look confusing, but I'll explain it. The key difference here is that the tasks you are running are not one-on-one -on -one linked to the JVM thread. And well, we've heard like this before, right? With the non-blocking IO part. So it's basically a similar thing. Like you have a number of work items, things you need to do, like methods you need to run, code you need to run. And they are not one-on-one -on -one linked to a JVM thread, but basically they're loosely linked to one or more JVM threads. And the thing here is that what the, the Java uh, developers try to accomplish is that you as a developer don't need to think about which task is going to run on which thread, but the, uh, like the, the JVM will handle this for you. Just like the JVM handles the mapping between the JVM thread and the OS thread, you as a developer don't need to worry about that. Same applies to the virtual threads. So to understand what that means concretely, I often compare it to cooking. You know, like you're, uh, you have a person doing the cooking, so the, the cook, and you have a number of tasks that you need to do, like. Uh, boiling some water, cutting some vegetables, etc., etc. But the relation between the cook and the tasks can be diverse, right? I mean, you can cook by yourself and do everything for one meal, or maybe you can cook together on the same meal, or maybe like with a group of people, you create multiple meals, or even with one person, create multiple meals. You know, so there's like a, a many-to-many -many relationship between the cooks and the meals, and it's not like uh, when you uh, have two persons that it will go twice as fast, but it can go faster because you can parallelize some tasks and some tasks you cannot. So to introduce some terminology here, um, the threads as we know them, so the threads that are running the main method or some runnable when you create your own thread, they are now called platform threads. So it's just a name change, but basically, the threads you are currently using in all the previous uh, versions of uh, Java, and um, they are platform threads, and they are the ones that are just linked one-on-one -on -one to an OS thread and one-on-one -on -one to some piece of code you're running. So if you create a thread pool and you submit some work, then that work gets executed on one of the threads, which is called a platform thread, which is linked to an OS thread. Uh, there's a new kind of thread called carrier thread, which basically is still a platform thread, but it's only dedicated for usage with virtual threads. So the carrier thread, you must imagine it as just a, like a fork join pool of uh, a thread pool of threads that are dedicated for executing virtual threads. It's created by the JVM and managed by the JVM, so you don't have to create it yourself. But every time you start a virtual thread, it gets executed on one or more carrier threads. Uh, the implementation of these are the same. Uh, what's new is also the concept of a virtual thread 
it's called a thread and it uses the thread API. So for de while developing, you can just create virtual threads like you create regular threads. But actually, it's not uh, an actual thread, but it gets executed on these carrier threads. And they are much more lightweight. So in terms of memory footprint, one virtual thread uses a lot less memory than uh, a carrier or platform thread. So what's cool about having all these virtual threads running on a pool of carrier threads? Well, uh, that's where the concept of suspension comes in. And I'll explain later when it suspends, but just imagine you have two virtual threads that are both trying to execute some piece of code, uh, different pieces of code. And well, in this case, virtual thread uh, two starts first. So we have a timeline here. Uh, it starts doing some work and it gets executed on this carrier thread here. We only have one carrier thread at, uh, at this moment, but in reality, we have more, obviously. So you see that carrier thread is executing the virtual thread two part here. And at some point, virtual thread two encounters some blocking IO operation where it can suspend because, well, it doesn't have anything to do. So at this point, it suspends. So this virtual thread two uh, pauses, actually. And you can see here that the carrier thread is uh, doing uh, nothing for this period of time as well. But at some point, virtual thread one also wants to execute and has some piece of code to execute. And you can see that this same carrier thread can now execute the code from virtual thread one while virtual thread two is just waiting for a reply or some disk operation, whatever. Um, but at this point, it wants to wake up, but well, virtual, uh, the carrier thread is busy at this moment, uh, so it has to wait a bit. So if you have multiple carrier threads, of course, it can start on another thread. But in this case, we have to wait until virtual thread one um, is going to do some blocking IO, and then two can finish its work, and then at some point, one can finish its work. So you can see that there are two threads, two pieces of code, basically uh, acting together uh, on one thread, we can merge together on this uh, carrier thread. Uh, but you can also see that there is some uh, possibility of blocking if you like, do more than, uh, if you want to do more than the number of threads you have available. So when does it suspend? Basically every blocking IO method, blocking method in the Java uh, language package has been made suspendable. So if you're running your code on a virtual thread and it encounters one of those methods, it can suspend and can get pass the, uh, the, the carry thread to some other virtual thread to continue. So imagine like IO calls, reading uh, uh, streams, writing streams, et cetera, et cetera. There are a few exceptions. So if you have a synchronized block, the traditional synchronized keyword that we have in Java, um, it won't suspend because that's uh, prone to, to deadlocks, of course. So in case of synchronized block or when there's like a, a native method call, then uh, it will not suspend your virtual thread. However, if you're using the, the locked mechanisms from uh, the Java util concurrent package, it can still uh, um, handle that and suspend it. So it, uh, it's supported by the virtual thread uh, implementation. So when can we use this? Well, basically in the traditional thread per request style server applications we saw before, just using virtual threads instead of, uh, well, the traditional platform threads will already enable you to scale these threads uh, more easily than uh, before. So it's typical for uh, highly concurrent IO bound code, like a server application handling a lot of incoming requests and doing some database calls, et cetera, et cetera. In those cases, it's good to be able to scale up the number of threads uh, higher than the number of uh, uh, platform threads you had available before. However, if your application is doing a lot of CPU bound code, like calculations, etc., those are not scalable on virtual threads because, well, it's still, it, it will never suspend in that case. So there's no use in just spinning up virtual threads to do calculations. So. If you're using a Java parallel stream, for example, it will not do that on the, the, the virtual threads. It will still just use some fork join pool for that. 
So to create virtual threads, uh, it's pretty easy. You can just call start virtual thread and give it a runnable. Uh, you can use uh, a thread pool that creates a virtual thread for every uh, task you submit. So you have an executor uh, for that. Uh, of course, I can show the example that everybody about like, who does a presentation about virtual threads shows like spinning 100,000 threads and then calling thread.sleep and saying, hey, look, it's scalable, uh, amazing. But of course, the reality is that um, you still have finite resources. So, I mean, it's a nice example. It's more like a gimmick, right? Um, one thing about virtual threads, the idea is never to pull them. So, because they are cheap to create, they should never be reused. So, they're always like one-off. Like, you spin, uh, spin up a virtual thread, do some stuff, and when it's done, it gets garbage collected. Because a virtual thread keeps its stack, its memory, just on the heap. So when it's done, it gets garbage collected like every other uh, well, uh, piece of memory uh, in, uh, on the heap. Um, so there's no need to manually pull them. Just create a new one whenever you need, and uh, the JVM will handle the, the scheduling for you. So speaking of pooling, it sounds like with virtual threads, you get like this infinity pool of threads, right? You can just spin up threads however you, uh, you feel like. However, just like an infinity pool, I mean, it still has uh, a limit, right? And I want to keep in, uh, make sure that you keep in mind that it's not like using virtual threads will solve everything and you can just scale infinitely. There's always a limit. So how do we know if we get better performance? Well, measure, uh, test it. It's not a given fact that when you switch your application that you have currently uh, running in production to virtual threads, that it's going to be faster. Uh, it's impossible to guarantee that. In some cases, it might be. In some cases, it might not be. It totally depends on the use case. So there's actually this presentation from uh, this guy, Mark Thomas. He's uh, a committer of the Apache Tomcat application server, so he, he knows what he's talking about. And he did some tests um, basically measuring the effect of switching to virtual threads and back uh, um, in the Tomcat application server. So if you're more interested in a deep dive of uh, this performance measurements, uh, check out this, uh, this link. So moving on to structured concurrency. Um, as we know, concurrency can be hard, right? I mean, sometimes it's already hard to debug your own sequential code. So let alone when there are like multiple threads spinning up and doing things, it's hard to um, figure out what's going on uh, and when. So with structured concurrency, basically, we try to um, make it easier to reason about this uh, your concurrent code. So given this sequential piece of code, which is just single-threaded way of cooking pasta, again, cooking, you can see like just by reading this code, you can already reason about the order of execution, right? I mean, it's simple. We know that serve dish will never be called before prepare dish because it's defined after serve, uh, after prepare dish. And we know that if something goes wrong in prepare dish, that serve dish will never execute, right? And the same for prepare dish. We see that two methods are being called here, the prepare pass and the make sauce. And we know that prepare dish will never finish before those two methods have also finished in this particular order. So it's easy to reason about this code. Also, when we see a stack trace, we can deduce what piece of code did run and what didn't run. So what if I told you we can apply the same constructs also to, um, well, just structured concurrent, like concurrent code. So imagine the same piece of code, but we see, well, because we're hungry, we want to finish quicker. So we want to make the pasta and the sauce in parallel. So with structured concurrency, you can um, create this block or a, a scope, basically, where you can do concurrent stuff. Um, but at the same time, you can reason about the, the order of execution, also the, the, the cleaning up, etc. So in this case, we start a structured scope, task scope, as it's called. And don't worry about the shutdown on failure. It's not a JVM shutdown but it means shutting down the scope in case of a failure. 
Uh, there's also a, a shutdown on success, which is basically like if you want to spawn a number of items and stop as soon as one of them finishes. But shutdown of failure basically means I want to do multiple things, and if one of, the, one of them goes wrong, I want to stop doing those things. And we can see here the good old-fashioned future, where we can fork a new process, or in this case, it's actually starting a virtual thread, um, spawning a, a virtual thread doing some task, and actually, in this case, doing two tasks. And then we wait for them both to be done, and then if something goes wrong, uh, went wrong, we want to throw an exception there. And if nothing went wrong, then we return our dish with the result of the futures, which are both both complete in this uh, on this line. Um, it's uh, already a bit Kotlinified, you know. I've used the 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 use instead of the try with resources, and uh, of course the the way of writing lambda here is also nice. But you still see like it leaks a bit of like, it, it reads a bit like Java code instead of Kotlin, right? So. Of course, you can create your own extension methods to make this look more pretty and uh, more kotlin -y, but it's it's a start, right? So yeah, it's an it's an early implementation of structured concurrency with uh, some basic functionality, but the idea is to be extensible for both the the, the third-party libraries that want to use this, but also in the future with future JVM versions, the idea is to expand on this and um, introduce more functionalities. So scope values, the idea with scope values is to share data within and across threads, um, basically giving um, a scope of code um, access to certain variables where you can have the guarantee that within that scope of code that variable will, will have a certain value, but outside of the scope it's cleaned up for you. So to give an example, large piece of code, but I'll uh, skip through it. So imagine we have some string we want to have as a scoped value. We can define it like this, pretty easy. And with the scoped value dot where method, you can say, okay, within the scope of, uh, well, this block of code, so the one starting here and ending here, I want the my text scoped value to have the value text one. Which means that because here we're inside the block, we call my text.get, it will print text one. If we call some nested function, we print it again, we still get text one. So within that scope, my text will always be text one. If you try to call my text.get outside of this scope value block, you will get an exception. If you redefine my text within a scope block, you can. So you can say, okay, we're inside this scope block, but we're creating a, a, a child scope, you might say where we override this value with, well, text2 in this case. And you'll see it will print text2 here. And even if you submit uh, a new virtual thread, you create a new virtual thread, still, because you're within that scope, the value will still uh, remain text2. So even within this block, you will still have a scoped value of text2. So I'm hearing some of you think like, yeah, but what about thread locals, right? That's the same idea. Well, uh, scope values is not meant to completely replace thread locals. Um, thread locals will still be available. And the idea is that there are some use cases of thread locals that are that fit better with uh, scope values. But thread locals can still be used. Even with virtual threads, you can still use thread locals because Thread local values are bound to virtual threads and not to carrier threads. So that's why if you switch your application server to uh, uh, with the thread per request style to virtual threads, you can, your transaction context, your login context, uh, etc., they are still linked to the virtual thread executing your request. So that that still works. However, there are some cases of thread locals where they are being used to cache certain values that are maybe expensive to create, or um, they're like uh, not thread safe, or maybe even both. And in those uh, cases, you shouldn't use um, thread locals anymore. I mean, for example, the, s some people, they create thread locals of a simple date format so that every time the simple date format is needed, 
for those of you that don't know, that's not thread safe. Um, it uses the one that's in the current thread. So if you do that for virtual threads, you're creating a lot of simple date format instances where you might say, well, um, maybe I want to pool it or some way or figure it out in some other way. So if they're cheap to create, you can still do it. But if they're uh, like more expensive to create, imagine that you're not using thread locals uh, to cache values anymore in case of virtual threads. So just an overview of the comparison. Um, an in, uh, important difference between thread locals and scope values is the mutability. So thread locals are mutable, right? You can just call thread local dot set and you can set a new value for that thread local for the current thread. But scope values, they are immutable. I mean, of course you can create a child scope where it has a diff different value, but you cannot override the value in the current scope you're in. So imagine things like security context, it might be nice to implement that with scoped uh, values because you, at, at the beginning of the request, you can say, okay, I want to execute this scoped value, uh, sorry, this piece of code with a scoped value containing the current principal or authentication object. And you know that it's not overridden anywhere in the called code. The scoping of uh, Thread locals is, of course, also larger than uh, with uh, scope values because with scope values, you, you simply say, okay, it's only value, value, uh, valid within this block of code, where a thread local is basically valid everywhere the, within the bounds of the thread. So even if, like, if you're reusing uh, platform threads in a thread pool, you always have to make sure you clean up all your thread locals because if you forget, then some might leak through to other pieces of code where with scope values, you get automatic cleanup. There's also some memory efficiency here because, well, propagating to child threads, um, for thread locals, you, ha you have to copy the references, where scope values, they don't need to copy because, well, they're immutable, so they can reuse the same. And, well, they both support virtual threads, so uh, there's no difference there. So, that was uh, Project Loom in a nutshell. So, well, the people already familiar with Kotlin coroutines, I hear you guys think like, yeah, I mean, we have uh, similar things like virtual threads, right? I mean, we have suspending functions, and, well, structure and concurrency, yeah, we have that as well. Scope values, well, I mean, we have coroutine context, right? So what's the difference here? Well, there are a few key differences, but also a lot of similarities. Let's start with the suspending functions. So, like with virtual threads, in coroutines we can suspend and resume functions, right? But the key difference here is that we can define our own suspension points. So we can create our own suspend uh, method and decide, okay, at some point I want to suspend, I want to call some other suspending function. Uh, so there's a lot more control there. Maybe it will come in the future in, in Java as well, when, where we can create our own suspending virtual threads, but for now, it's not possible yet. So there, there's a, a bit more power here in the, in the Kotlin uh, implementation. But of course, because, well, it's Kotlin and it's multi-platform, so it's developed on top of, for example, the JVM and other uh, runtimes, it has to be implemented by the Kotlin compiler. And we know that in the previous JVM versions, we didn't have virtual threads. So how does it work? How can it suspend threads, right? So it's implemented by using a concept called continuations. And I'll give you a crash course in continuations now. So imagine we have this piece of code, a suspending function that simply creates a counter, increments the counter, and then prints the result. And in the meantime, it has two points where it suspends. So here we call the, the yield, and here we call the delay function, which are both, both functions from the Kotlin coroutines library that are suspending. So th those are points where your co coroutine might suspend and resume at a later stage. And we add some print lines in the meantime to uh, give some clarity. So if we compile this to JVM bytecode and then decompile it back to Java code, it gets really ugly. So I tried to clean it up a little bit but, and left out some things. But in essence, this is what happens. So your suspend fun my fun that returns an int actually gets converted into a function getting some continuation object and returning an object instead of an int. So there's already some magic happening here, right? I mean, you cannot simply call this method anymore from, uh, from your Java code, for example. 
And the continuation object that gets passed basically has two properties. Well, it has some more, but these are the most relevant ones. It has the my counter integer, which is basically the local state of this function. And it has a label variable, and that's just uh, an integer as well. It starts with zero. And when the function gets called for the first time, it's basically just a switch statement on that label. So you can say it's like a state machine. So the first time it's zero, it goes into this piece of code. And you can see, well, the print line start. We can see that the my counter gets initialized with one, like here. And then because we are calling yield, we are storing the current state in the continuation object. So the continuation of my counter, this one, gets the value of our local variable, and we increase the label to one. And at that point, we say, OK, we're calling this, this yield function. We're passing a continuation. And if the yield function returns this magic object saying we need to suspend, we actually just return from this method with that same suspended uh, object. So we actually stop executing that method. If the yield function says, well, there's nothing uh, um, else going on, so simply just resume. You don't need to suspend. Or in the later stage, uh, we need to resume our coroutine, so we call the my function again with the same continuation object. Well, we end up in the next case statement where we continue after the yield. We see that the local variable is restored with the value from the continuation. And we execute the next piece of code, the my counter plus plus. And again, we encounter a suspending function, et cetera, et cetera. And this, uh, in the end, we actually return the my counter value if we're done. So you can see that using suspending functions does add some complexity to the bytecode. So there is some runtime impact uh, here um, when you're calling suspending functions, even though they don't suspend. And it's a, a bit of a trade-off, right? I mean, at, at one point you can say, well, if we have to suspend, well, basically we are already ready to suspend because we have the continuation object. We can just fill it with our local state and we can suspend easily. Uh, in comparison to virtual threads, where basically when you decide I have to suspend my virtual thread, the entire stack needs to be copied away and another uh, stack needs to be copied back. So there's basically... Uh, when no suspending is going on, then uh, virtual threads are a bit more performant. But in case of suspending, then uh, a coroutine can suspend quicker than uh, a virtual thread, basically. So some of you might wonder, like, hey, okay, so there's this magic object that you can return uh, to indicate that a coroutine is suspended. So I wanted to try this out, like, okay, what if I use reflection to actually return this value from my own suspending function? And yeah, then you get an infinite loop, indeed. But yeah, it's totally useless, but I just wanted to try it out. Okay, structured concurrency. Basically, the same as with uh, virtual threads, only, yeah, it, it reads a bit nicer. So we, again, have the same uh, pasta dish, where here we can define a coroutine scope, where we say, okay, we want to do the pair, prepare pasta and the make sauce asynchronously, and we await the results. So it's a bit more compact, but same principle. What about the coding context? Well, also pretty easy. Uh, you can see, basically, you can view the coding context as a, a map of key value pairs with some predefined keys, and you can add your own coding context elements to that map. So we do that here. We define our coroutine context element as a class, where we say, OK, we have a, a my text class with some text value. And we use the with context function to assign a value to that, uh, to that context, uh, specifically to that context element. So we can call the context, uh, coroutine context, fetch our context based on the key we define there, and then we get our text. And the same applies here. You can override it in child coroutines, where you can simply provide a new value, and it's only valid within that block. So quick overview. Scope values, coroutine context, they're both 
immutable within the current context, but you can still override them for child context, like I said before. But within the context, you cannot simply override uh, values. So pretty much the same. Uh, the scope also the same. It's within a block of code. Uh, the propagation to child threads is a bit different. In case of scope values, well, like I said before, you don't need to copy it. Um, the difference with co coding context is that the moment any element in the context changes and you create uh, a child coding scope, then it needs to copy that context to a new uh, to a new context, basically. But I think in reality, you don't need to worry about it. It's pretty uh, straightforward. Uh, virtual thread support, yeah, they're both supported, but with coding context, uh, it's a bit a question like, okay, do I actually need virtual threads when I'm running coroutines? It depends a bit on wi which dispatcher you use, but I just want to say, if you're switching to virtual threads at some point while executing your coroutines, the context still propagates and there's no worry there. But yeah, do you need the coroutine context for that? Or do you need virtual threads? That's up to you. So, we have virtual threads versus suspending threads uh, functions. Structured concurrency is available in both. Scope values, coding context, similar concepts. So what's the big difference, right? Well, one of the fundamental differences is uh, being implicit versus explicit. In virtual threads, it's implemented in a transparent way. You just have a piece of code you write like, like you do usually, and the moment you run that code on a virtual thread instead of uh, a regular thread, it can suspend and it can use the capabilities of uh, virtual threads. So when you see some method signature, you don't know if it's going to block or not or if it's going to suspend or not. It depends on where it's running. And it's transparent for the developer, basically. Where with calling coroutines, of course, you have to explicitly define suspend. You have to uh, you can uh, you have to have a different style of coding because well, suspending functions can only be called by other suspending functions. So you have to like more think about the the split between your asynchronous functions and your synchronous functions. If you're interested in the theory behind this, then I would suggest uh, checking out this uh, link below, which is um, a blog article called What Color Is Your Function? where the same concept is uh, discussed, but then in regards to JavaScript, where you have like the async versus the, the synchronous function. So the same principle, but it's a nice discussion uh, on uh, the impact that has on your code. Um, yeah, so which one is better? If you ask Brian Getz, the Java language architect, he says like, yeah, it's, uh, it's very nice that we can implement this in a transparent way so developers don't have to think about it and it just works out of the box and amazing. And then at the other end of the spectrum, you have uh, Roman uh, Elizarov from uh, JetBrains. He's the, the Kotlin project lead who says, well, it's actually good that we're being explicit about when we're suspending so that you as a developer know what's going on when you're reading the code. So. Yeah, what's my opinion? I tend a bit towards the explicitness, even though it trickles down th throughout your code. But yeah, I, I do like being explicit so that you, even when reading your code, you can know like, okay, this function is suspending. So I have to keep in mind that it may not finish immediately, but it may finish later when there's some blocking going on or blocking, suspending. What about the use cases of uh, coroutines versus virtual threads? Well, coroutines, you can use them to do asynchronous computations, asynchronous UI, like Android development, where you can update your UI in a separate coroutine. Um, simple futures work, we can uh, create generators, like sequence generators, very powerful thing. For example, typical example you see is like uh, generating a Fibonacci range, but of course you can also have like, more useful uh, things. We have channel-based concurrency where we can like, connect uh, streams of data together and do some operations there. Actor-based concurrency where we can implement actors that have a particular piece of functionality and then that scales perfectly. A lot of different use cases. And virtual threads, well, we can 
upgrade our JVM server applications, basically. For now. I mean, of course, in the future, who knows. So there's a wide variety of things you can do with coroutines that you cannot do with virtual threads yet. Of course, target platform differs as well. The coroutines are cr cross-platform. You can run them on whatever platform uh, that uh, supports Kotlin. It's implementation independent, so it, it interact, uh, interoperates with your completable futures, with your reactive library, etc., etc. Where virtual threads, well, they are of course JVM only. So, what now? The reactive high-level concepts, I think they are still very valuable, very, uh, very good, but they are not needed in most of our applications that we write. If you just want non-blocking I.O. and are not interested in things like back pressure or like uh, complicated streams of data uh, combining them, then you don't need a reactive framework. So then in that case, using virtual threads can actually be very uh, uh, a simple solution for you to still have non-blocking I.O. Kotlin coroutines, yeah, still very powerful library. So uh, if you have a use case for it, definitely use it. It's not going to go away now because of virtual threads. And if you're interested in virtual threads, yeah, just start playing with them. It's, um, yeah, of course, only going to get better in the coming uh, JDK versions. So it's good to uh, start getting some experience with it. And the future of Loom, I think, yeah, the adoption in libraries and frameworks, of course, still has to start up a bit now that the virtual threads is finally going to be production ready. I think it will start to lift off. So we'll see some nice interactions with it. Uh, the structured concurrency constructs, yeah, they're still a bit simple, but I expect it to evolve as well. So it's going to be uh, very nice as well. And probably, as we've seen like with other JDK uh, functionalities being added in the last versions, we're, we're going to see some other constructs uh, being introduced as well, right? I mean, they're basically learning from each other as well. So it will grow, definitely. Thank you. Uh, if you want to watch this presentation or, or like this, the, the slides again, you can uh, see it on this link. Uh, if you have any questions, I think yeah, we have still have some time, so that's good. Uh, and if you come up with a question later, then you can always uh, contact me on LinkedIn or just I'll be here in the conference uh, in the coming days. Thank you. Any questions? Yeah, so the, the question is, uh, a logical uh, thing would be that uh, Kotlin coding starts using virtual threads, and if I know if anything like that's going on. Um, well, what, what uh, Roman Elizarov from uh, JetBrains did say was that they would like to use it at some point, if it's available, but at the moment, like the implementation of virtual threads as it is now is pretty closed, so it's not easy to use it from outside the JVM, basically, like from the Kotlin compiler. But probably at some point, the, the APIs for that uh, for, for a virtual thread is going to be more open. And then, yeah, they are they are planning on using it uh, as an yeah, implementation uh, if you're running Kotlin coroutines on the JVM, indeed. Yeah. So it's platform-bound, uh, in a sense. So yeah. You might imagine, like at, at at this point, what you can already do is say, I create a, a Kotlin Kotlin dispatcher that uses the virtual thread uh, per task executor. So in that case, every coroutine you start sp uh, spins up a virtual thread. So it can be used. Um, you can say, in that sense, it's already interoperable. The the question there is more like, is that actually needed? Like, what benefits do you get from it? But yeah, so the moment the the API of the virtual threads, for example, if you could implement your own co uh, continuations in the JVM, that would be something that can be used by the Kotlin JVM library, of course. Yeah. Other questions? No? Okay. 
Well, thank you uh, for your time.